Welcome back. Now we bring you Israel and the Middle East, a segment of Shalom Jerusalem, sponsored by the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem. Here is your host, Esther Allen. Hello and welcome to Shalom Jerusalem. I'm Esther Allen. On today's segment, we are going to be talking about the restoration and blessings. And I'm so excited to introduce you to our guest, Dr. and Pastor Brian Fisher. Brian Fisher is one of the founding members of the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, and he is currently the senior pastor at Grace Bible Church, which is in College Station, Texas. Go Aggies. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for being with us today. Thanks for inviting me on. Glad to be with you, Esther. Pastor Brian, as we begin, I want to take our viewers back to one of the founding statements of the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem. Of course, all of our affirmations and denials can be found at our website at JerusalemAlliance.com. But I want to read to our viewers one of these things that you were a part of writing, and I would like for you to expand on it. We affirm that the covenants include the restoration of creation, the formation and the preservation of the Jewish people, the promise of a land for the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and blessings for all nations through Jesus, the Messiah. Pastor Brian, what covenants are still in existence as talked about in this statement? Yeah, the covenants that we're talking about are the, the covenants that really structure the, the entire uh, redemption history that God has laid out. So they're the covenants that give Israel an identity, but also structure redemption for all peoples. We're talking about the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. And the, the Mosaic covenant, we would say in Christ, has been fulfilled and now set aside, as the writer of the Hebrews talks about. Jesus has inaugurated the new covenant. But for the Jews who have yet to believe that Jesus is their Messiah, they're still living under the Mosaic covenant. But in that sense, all of these covenants are still in effect. Wow, it is so good to hear that. All of these covenants are still in effect. God is certainly a covenant keeping God. Um, Pastor Brian, the next question that I wanna ask you is, why does Abraham's promise still exist? And why were these promises given to Abraham? Can you tell us a little bit more about the Abrahamic covenant? Yeah, the Abrahamic covenant, some have said, is the, the backbone of Scripture. And I would argue that you really can't understand Scripture itself without understanding the Abrahamic covenant, which included three fundamental promises, land, seed, blessing. And the promises were given to Abraham ultimately as a, as a unilateral grant covenant. God said, I will do this for you and your seed, Abraham. Now, the, the question arises, well, what about Israel's disobedience? And as a result of their disobedience, they were removed from the land. They went into exile. So have those promises been removed from them or are they still in place? Let me read to you from uh, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. It says this, thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its, that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord. Then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done. Notice you have two if-then statements. And what's critical to realize is uh, th this statement was given to Israel while they were in exile. So while they were under God's discipline for their disobedience, if I can paraphrase, God is, is saying to them, because you're under discipline, you may wonder, have I cast you off? And the answer is no. L look up in the sky. Do you, do you see the, the sun and the moon and the stars? If that fixed order ceases, then I'll cast you off. But you see them. So every time you look in the sky, you are reminded that I am faithful to my promises. And the promises he's referring to are those promises given to Abraham of land, seed, and blessing. So those are, those are eternal promises that, that remain in place until they are completely fulfilled. Pastor Brian, thank you for always pointing us back to scripture. It is important. You know, the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem worked with Lifeway Research, and we conducted a survey and a study about evangelicals' views towards Israel. The study revealed that younger evangelicals are confused about the land promise to Israel. 
Let me ask you, do the land promises in scripture apply to the Jewish people today? Do Jewish people have a biblical right to the land in Israel? Yeah, it's part of the unconditional promises that God gave to Abraham. So, uh, you know, when those promises are fulfilled, it, it will look very different. Israel will be living in the land and they will be experiencing physical and spiritual prosperity or blessing in the land. And there will be no more enemies around attacking. And we, we still have not even seen that take place yet. So we anticipate a future fulfillment of that promise. And the reason, in a sense, we can trust God's promises to us as believers that when we, when we die, we can, we can go before the Lord and know that our sins are, in fact, forgiven and that we, we have, in fact, been reconciled. And we know that we have eternal life is because God is a covenant-keeping God. And if he's unwilling to keep his covenants to Israel, how do we trust that he'll keep his covenant to us? This is the fundamental nature of God. When he makes a promise, he keeps a promise. And those promises have not ultimately been fulfilled to Israel yet. So they, they, they must be fulfilled. When God makes a promise, he keeps a promise. Amen. Uh, for those of you interested in looking at more of the findings from this study with Lifeway, please visit the JerusalemAlliance.com website. Pastor Brian, my next question is that we are seeing an increase of replacement theology, otherwise known as supersessionism. And it is the belief that the church nowadays, the present church has replaced Israel. And this is a really prevalent theology, especially in churches in the West. So can you explain to me why we are seeing a rise in replacement theology, where it comes from, and if you believe it's biblical? Well, I think, I think, I think there's a couple causes for that uh, theology to be coming more prominent. One is that there's been a, a resurgence of uh, interest in Calvinism and covenant theology. And as a result, I think a lack of understanding of the biblical covenants and the the distinct nature of the biblical covenants as the framework for the theology of the whole Bible. So, um, you know, in covenant theology, there is a, a, a blending or a mixing. All of the biblical covenants are seen as just a different manifestation of the same covenant. But in fact, when uh, God gives the new covenant to Israel, he says this, I'm going to take you back to Jeremiah 31 again. He says, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand. So the new covenant will be uh, distinct. It, it's, a, it's a new covenant, but it's still a covenant that's made with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And it is through the enablement of the new covenant, right? a, a new heart that's a heart of flesh, a desire, ability. God says, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. It's through that that Israel receives its promises. And it's through that also that uh, Gentile peoples, non-Jewish peoples are, are grafted in, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11, not taking the place of the nation of Israel, but grafted into the promises of Israel as God originally stated to Abraham. In you, Abraham, all of the king or the nations, all the peoples, the ethnos of the world will be blessed in you. Not that those ethnos will take the place, place of Israel, but they will be blessed through Israel. So I think that there's a resurgence in the uh, interest in Calvinism and covenant theology, and so many of your, your really popular writers and speakers are in that vein that um, I'm not sure younger evangelicals understand that there's an alternative interpretation that sees, the, the, sees continuity between Israel and the church, but also a distinction between Israel and the church. So if I can take you back to to forward to Ephesians chapter two, which is the critical text, or Ephesians three rather, Paul says about the church that it's actually a mystery. And he defines a mystery as something not revealed beforehand to the apostles and prophets, but now revealed. So that the church is actually something new. It didn't exist in the Old Testament. It began to exist on the day of Pentecost, when as Jesus predicted in John seven, God would pour out his spirit and he would form this new, in a sense, mystery form of the kingdom that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 13 not as a replacement of Israel, but because Israel had rejected Jesus as Messiah, there would be this interim period of time in which there'd be a new form of the kingdom, a mystery form of the kingdom, Jews and Gentiles together in one body, we call it the church. But until the promises are completed for Israel, they still remain in place. And, Israel, and the church doesn't take over those promises in, in a, merely a spiritual form. 
because the promises are not just spiritual, they're also physical. Something new, you know, um, interestingly enough, uh, Dr. Fisher, my recent book is Your New Name, and I studied that word new in scripture. And one of the definitions is that you are found not like you were before. So we're familiar with the new covenant, with the new testament of us being a new creation. But I love how you explained that word new to us just now. Thank you. I want to reference again this survey from Lifeway Research. And we found that 72% of evangelicals wish that they knew more about what the Bible has to say about Israel. So Pastor Brian, in closing, please speak to the pastor watching. Speak to the viewer who cares about what God has to say in his word. Speak to the church leader and the person sitting in the pew. What are our next steps to study what God has to say about Israel? Yeah, I would encourage you, rather than picking up a book on eschatology, that you go back and read uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Re read the prophets, and you know, in particular, focus on the the new covenant promises. Because, the, in a sense, what you'll notice as you look at the new covenant promises is that they are uh, an uh, an elaboration of land, seed, and blessing. Right. The the new covenant is the means of fulfillment of the promises originally made to Abraham, and that really structures our eschatology. Now, certainly, the New Testament adds a lot of details into the eschatology, but you can't understand the book of Revelation if you don't, haven't read the book of Daniel. So I think that you need to start, if you're, you're a pastor or you're just a, a, a believer in a church and you want to understand what's going to structure end times, what structures end times is the covenant promises. That's where to start. So I would start by reading the prophets and looking at, looking for specific covenant promises that relate to land that relate to uh, descendants or seed that relate to blessings which are both physical and spiritual and then you will begin to understand also the nature of what the church actually is not as a replacement of israel but something that's been grafted into these promises well, these are certainly important conversations to have. We are just scratching the surface here at Shalom Jerusalem. But Pastor Brian, thank you for leading us. Thank you for helping start the organization, the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem. Thank you for the way that you are leading the local church. And thank you for teaching us how to have a biblical view of Israel.